Okay, well, that looks like everyone who is in the waiting room uh, is there. So, um, uh, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, and um, uh, my name is Michael Carroll. I am a professor of law here at American University Washington College of Law. I am a co faculty director of our program on information justice and intellectual property. Um, and as part of our program, we uh, try to uh, hold events that, that comment on the topics of the day and the news of the day. And um, <clears throat> so this is a rapid response event, uh, sort of to help us distill the information we know about what happened when Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp became unavailable for about six hours last week, um, and to talk through kind of some of the implications and lessons learned from, from this incident. Um, and um, I am uh, delighted to be joined by my colleague, uh, Professor L Laura Donardis, who is now the interim dean of our School of Communications and is also affiliated with the law school's program on tech law and security. Um, and Professor Donardis has so many accomplishments that we would spend the whole webinar <laughs> celebrating them, but she's a globally recognized internet, internet governance scholar um, and has published seven books uh, that are related to the topics that we're going to talk about uh, today. Uh, in 2020, Wired UK listed her as one of the 32 global innovators building a better future, uh, which is a pretty nice honor. Uh, she's also been honored by her students, uh, having won a, a prestigious teaching award uh, and a series of other recognitions. She's, she's been widely published in the press uh, including a, 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 a uh, article in the Washington Post recently uh, about the Facebook outage. Um, and so Laura, thank you for making time. We're really delighted that you were uh, able to join us here. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm happy to be here. Um, and I will just say my, my, my relationship to this topic is that I teach a class called Cyber Law, which is a, an overview of legal issues related to the internet. Uh, Professor Donardis has the deep technical expertise. Um, I, I know enough to be dangerous as a lawyer, uh, but I would not, I am not a software engineer or network uh, operator. Um, but, uh, but as uh, to the lawyers in the room, if you have not taken cyber law with me, part of the, one of the takeaways from today is that uh, we need to understand what's going on uh, on the internet more than the average user. Uh, and since average users were so affected by this outage, perhaps average users should be curious about what's going on under the hood, if you may, if I may, uh, as well. And so where I'm gonna start is um, uh, kind of uh, the, the, the internet that we take for granted, the Facebook, the Instagram, the WhatsApp that we take for granted. Um, and so before we turn to what went wrong, let's, let's talk about what happens when things go right and you open up your app um, and you get to look at pictures of cute kittens or you get to have a WhatsApp conversation uh, or the like. Um, and what you're doing uh, and what Facebook is doing is relying on an internet structure and architecture that was built uh, starting back in the 1960s for very different purposes than creating a social network. It was actually a network of research institutions, um, but, it, but its architecture has proven to be uh, in some ways, remarkable in, in its ability to scale up and, and accommodate all of this rapid growth. It's also an architecture that has a series of issues and vulnerabilities that we'll get into sort of at the back end of the conversation. But let me just um, show you what the designers of the internet had in mind when they made that, because we're, what went wrong at Facebook involves um, some settings and some uses of these, uh, what are called protocols. These are the general rules by which the, uh, the network operates. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna share my screen for just a minute. Um, and, and, and some core points to understand is every time you use your phone, every time you use your, com uh, your computer, you're using a device that is limited by its ability to follow rules. And so it can only do what it's programmed to do. And it needs very clear rules about what it should and shouldn't do in order to be useful to you. Um, and so what makes the internet kind of amazing is that all, all of the different players on the internet have essentially agreed to use the same set of rules, these protocols. 
Um, and one of my sayings in class is, you know, you have to be careful with any generalization the internet is. But one way to look at the internet is it's an agreement. It's, agreement. it's an agreement among all of the different players in the network to cooperate with each other, to sh share uh, messages across their networks. Um, and in, at least in the, in the democratic world, outside of the authoritarian states, it's often private actors that are just operating under private agreements to do this, but it's in their interest to do that. And that's kind of what's amazing. So um, the, OSI, the OSI model is, is sort of the way to think about how the engineers that built this network thought about separating the different functions the network has to perform uh, so that different pieces of software or different rules sort of perform different jobs. And your phone and my computer are programmed to speak this language. We can't be on the internet unless we're speaking this language. So this is the common language of the internet. Um, and the, one of the beautiful things about, or the elegant things about the design is that the functions are supposed to be separated so that you keep the core bedrock functions as simple as possible so that you're using as few computer resources as possible and you put the complexity higher up in the stack. So when you open your Facebook and when you open your Instagram, you're all the way up here uh, and your, your, uh, your app is relying on these other six layers to allow you to connect to Facebook and allow you to send messages on WhatsApp and, and that. So we start with a physical layer. You need a, you know, a Wi-Fi, a physical can be wireless or wired, but you need some, physical means of actually exchanging data. Um, <clears throat> and then we need to actually be able to uh, format that data because again, the computer can only operate based on rules and computer A needs to be able to talk to computer B by both understanding that this is data and it's following these rules. The network layer is gonna tell you physically how, how messages are going to tr uh, travel from one uh, machine to another. And then um, we're going to package that data according to the internet protocol. So we need an address. Every, every computer on the network needs a unique number associated with it so that we can communicate with each other. We need a sender's ID and we need a recipient's ID. Um, and then we need to package that data into packets that, that, um, that can be transmitted. This is one of the amazing things about the internet is that these layers right here, they don't care about what kind of content you're communicating. Whether you're surfing the web, sending an email on a Zoom call like this, the underlying sort of structure of the internet is just sending little data packets uh, back and forth, regardless of the content that's inside that. And then we're gonna open up a session between us and that's what layer five is. Um, and then we're gonna make sure that the data is, is usable. So that's a sort of an additional layer of formatting. And then all of this data gets fed into Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, which interprets it according to the rules of Facebook, um, <clears throat> Instagram, or, or WhatsApp. And so that's, that's kind of this amazing separation of functions that allows this internet to scale up Anybody who speaks this language gets to be on the internet. Um, and, um, and, and you generally can use the app without you as a user having to care about any of these things, but you are relying on whoever programmed the app to know how to use this. And that's where things started uh, to go wrong. Um, and Laura, should I, I'm gonna turn to you and should I keep this up for a minute or do you want me to stop sharing? You can stop sharing it. Okay, um, so maybe can we get a little more specific about what parts of that structure, and that, that's not the whole structure because I didn't talk about the domain name system, which is sort of another layer on top of IP addresses, but, but where did the problems at Facebook start? Thank you very much for that introduction, Michael. And when you look at all of the layers, you can understand why we sometimes just get on the whiteboard and draw a cloud. <laughs> just draw a cloud, and that's the internet. Um, and, and even the layers that you presented there, which it, it's, a, it's a model or a framework 
for understanding the layers. And I think it helps to um, you know, disaggregate some of the protocols, but even that is very abstract. So it, you know, it's hard for people to, to understand. I, I think one way to bring it into the physical and virtual world in a real way is to, um, and then it, get into what happened at Facebook is to just say that um, another way to disaggregate this is to say that what we call the public internet in a nice neat model like that, it's actually made out of many different networks, um, private networks, and many different technical protocols. Even something like a phone uh, depends on, let's say, 100 technical standards in order to create interoperability. It's quite involved. And you know, similarly, people think of Facebook as magically existing in this cloud without thinking about it, because all you see when you access the internet is a device, um, an application, you might see the Wi-Fi network, uh, you know, uh, antenna that's close by, uh, but you don't see it all. So people think of Facebook as, um, you know, just being up in the cloud, but it actually operates. And I think this became visible during the outage. It operates its own enormous uh, private networks. And the same is true for a lot of major media companies, Google, it's, it's true of Google, large media companies. It's true for cloud computing, companies, um, you know, content distribution networks um, that few people have ever heard of, um, like Akamai, as well as network operators, which is what you traditionally think of as being one of those segments of network. So it's not one network. It acts as one network. We think of it as the public ne um, network and, and the public internet, but it actually is made up of these private networks, and many of them run by companies such as Facebook that operates its own network. So all of these, these networks have protocols that exist at those different layers. They also have, um, just think of the material aspect of this for a minute, uh, cables, fiber optic cable, switches, routers, um, interconnection points where each network has to conjoin with another network, buildings that you can walk in and um, go to the vending machine and grab a Diet Coke. I, I mean, you just think about the physical aspect of this, the systems of public key cryptography and encryption that have to be very protected, secure buildings that house these DNS, the domain name servers, which I'll get to in a, in a moment. And of course, massive server farms with massive air conditioning systems. So there's a lot in terms of the physical and um, uh, virtual uh, reality of this. Now, tying it to your framework that you queued up so nicely, um, the, there are three types of protocols that were really implicated in this outage. Now, the core of everything on the internet is, of course, the internet protocol. And that is, um, let me back up for one minute. The way that networks exchange information over the internet is through something called packet switching, which basically serves to break up an email or an image, let's say that Michael and I were sending an email to each other, it would be broken up into smaller packets, which think of like an envelope with the content inside. And not only does the envelope or the packet contain the content, but it also contains some administrative information, such as the destination internet address, the internet protocol address for where that's sent, the source address, and other kinds of overhead or administrative information. So that's the standard format for structuring information. Um, now, the IP addresses are what computers read, but humans don't, like Michael and I would not send a message to each other and say to our computer, please send this to 01100100100. We just wouldn't say that to reach the destination. Instead, we type in um, an email address or we type in an alphanumeric domain name, such as American.edu. And then that human understandable domain name has to be translated into the binary, binary just means zeros and ones, translated into the IP address for transmission over the internet. So that's done um, by the domain name system. The DNS is what we, everything is an acronym in this space, Michael, unfortunately, but let's just call it DNS, if you'll um, forgive a couple of acronyms, the domain name system. It's kind of a phone book for the internet that translates the human readable names into the computer readable, router readable IP addresses. So that's what it does. 
Um, that is going to be, um, I'll, I'll talk about what happened at Facebook in a moment, but that's a big part of it. Now there's, I wanna mention one other key protocol that makes all of this work and also was affected in the Facebook out outage. And that is the protocol that answers this question. <clears throat> if you have all of these networks that come together, they bilaterally come together or at an internet exchange point and they connect one network to the rest of the, um, you know, to other parts of the internet. Well, how do they coordinate with each other to, tell each other how to reach a destination or how to route information in the most efficient way over the internet. Um, they use a standard called Border Gateway Protocol or BGP, so Border Gateway Protocol. We know that the internet itself does not have um, you know, geographical borders. It doesn't correspond to, um, to those kinds of borders, but they do have borders and they're at the um, intersections of these networks, which can also be called the technically correct way is to call networks autonomous systems. They each have a unique number and they each use border gateway protocol to um, tell the world how to reach certain resources. Another way to say it is they use border gateway protocol to advertise to the rest of the world what IP addresses are reachable through the network. So putting all of this together, all of these systems that uh, Michael and I just mentioned uh, the layered approach, these three protocols that I mentioned, they all combined to contribute to the Facebook blackout. Now, according to Facebook, it was a command made during a routine um, maintenance function. We don't have information, at least I don't, about uh, what that command was, but that is what triggered the domain name system servers to stop working. So it introduced an error. It unintentionally took down all of the connections in their backbone network, basically cutting off their data centers from the rest of the internet and leading to uh, what can best be described as a cascade of events. The error first triggered Facebook's own DNS servers. So these domain name system servers that resolve human readable domain names into IP addresses, they're distributed all over the world and Facebook runs its own. The error triggered Facebook's DNS servers to stop answering queries. What that means is that the server stopped translating the requested sites for WhatsApp, for Instagram, and for Facebook into their associated IP addresses. And then Facebook's network in turn, because of this problem, stopped advertising the routes to its sites to the rest of the world using border gateway protocol. So without the ability to answer DNS queries, um, without the ability to advertise the IP addresses via border gateway protocol, Facebook essentially disappeared from the internet with no way for users to reach any of their services. Um, can, I, can I see if, I, if I've yeah. got this right? So if my computer, I, I say, computer, I want facebook.com, that that query should go to one of these servers that would actually tell my computer what IP address. And basically Facebook came back and said, Facebook, who's Facebook? I don't know. And then, then when I wanted to say, well, can I, I need to send a message to somebody at home at Facebook in order to let them know there's a problem. Facebook said, sorry, I can't route that. I can't, you can't, nobody's home. So it's, I don't know who Facebook is and nobody's home is basically what Facebook was telling the internet. Is that right? That is right. And you know, one additional dimension is that your query doesn't go right to Facebook. It goes through other kinds of intermediaries that also have DNS servers that then in turn lead to Facebook. And what happened to some of those servers is that they became um, overwhelmed with traffic because uh, Michael, what would you do if you received an error when you went to Facebook? What was what would be the first thing that you would do? Probably would try, it try, it, try it again. Try it again. <laughs> and then it, what would you do if it was a second time? You would try it again. And so, you know, millions of people were trying it again. And so while Facebook went down, there also were traffic problems at the on the rest of the internet. Uh, because people kept um, issuing those queries again. And, and you know, another question, you know, just adding a, a, another 
problem here is why did it take so long to restore? This was a pretty lengthy outage. And from what Facebook engineers publicly explained, and this makes sense from an engineering standpoint, is that the, the full network outage also meant that um, their own network specialists, their own engineers lost access to many of the tools that they would normally use to restore the services. And I'm were, sorry, but can we can we make fun of Facebook for a moment before getting serious? So this is Facebook engineers saying, how do I fix Facebook? Oh, go to Facebook, but I can't get to Facebook. Uh, so that we can have fun with that for a minute, but it's it's not so funny, right? Well, it's not funny. Um, a lot of people would say, well, what's the big deal losing access to the kittens? But in most parts of the world, Facebook is indistinguishable from the internet. I mean, I, you know, here in the United States, uh, there, there's a more, in some ways, a more diverse, even with the concentration um, in the monoculture of Facebook, there's still, there's a more diverse environment, but in some parts of the world, governments use Facebook to communicate with citizens and businesses use Facebook. So, you know, there's nothing funny about an outage and, you know, it, it, any outage can have life and death consequences. And fortunately they brought it back, back up after um, a matter of hours. But the, you know, you could also think of all the memes around this. Um, you know, they were also slowed down by internal security measures that you would want to stop unauthorized users from gaining access to its systems. So they were slowed down in that way also, not just the network outage, but uh, the internal security measures. So bottom line, it was, uh, you know, to summarize, it was a cascade of acronym problems, BGP, IP, DNS, and whatever that first maintenance uh, command was. So Mike, let me ask you something. Uh, what are the key, what would you say are the key takeaways or a, a couple of takeaways from this for lawyers that have to deal with um, internet architecture that's at the center of all of this? What do lawyers need to know? Yeah, thanks for that. Um, so one is, is to really understand this point that you are on the internet once your machine has an IP address. So every time you log into an, a network, whether you're at school or at home or at a coffee shop, there's a network that assigns your machine a number and that that's what makes you reachable and on the internet. So the, the mere, the fact that when I typed in facebook.com, it was not translating to that number didn't mean that Facebook was literally off the internet. It's just that nobody knew what number to dial to get a hold of those uh, machines. But it can be important because sometimes lawyers associate control of the domain name with being on the internet. And a couple of places where lawyers have made mistakes about that, there was before the whole um, um, uh, Edward Snowden issue with WikiLeaks, there was an earlier episode in which um, someone had posted some confidential financial information from a bank in the Cayman Islands. And the very expensive lawyers for the bank come running into court asking for an order to stop uh, wikileaks.org from being reachable. So the court issued the order and then somebody just tweeted out what WikiLeaks IP address was. And sure enough, all the journalists were able to just scoop up those documents because they were still on the internet and, and the lawyers didn't understand that. They'd asked for the wrong order because they didn't understand that if you have an IP address, you're still on the internet. Uh, this point is also true if you're reading news accounts about the so-called dark web, it makes it sound like there's this whole other secretive internet that uh, criminals in, uh, engage in. It's just the internet. What the dark just refers to using a protocol that makes the search engine not be able to find a domain name or list a domain name, or else people just using IP addresses and literally dialing each other's phone numbers to communicate, but they're communicating using the basic internet that we all use. It's just that they made themselves, they hide their identity and they, they make themselves unfindable. So it's kind of the flip side. Facebook made itself unfindable by accident. People on the dark web do that on purpose. Um, uh, so I think those, those would be probably the, the major points um, that I've got. 
Um, uh, and then I guess, um, Laura, you've written at length about how infrastructure can be co-opted as a proxy for power. So you mentioned about some of the different parties that rely on this infrastructure and can weaponize it in some ways. And can you talk a little bit more about that? Yes, and this, um, this issue of the weaponization and the politicization of infrastructure stems right from the point that you made about the DNS. So with, when you are resolving these names into numbers, you're not actually, and, and you use that to block site, block access to a site, you're not actually taking the site down. You're just, as Michael said, you're redirecting um, in some cases to a law enforcement message. Um, you're just blocking the way to get to that. So that, that um, hints at the kinds of uh, choke points that exist that could be used to block access and surveillance. And you know, what I would say is that these systems aren't just important you know, when Facebook goes down or anything else. Um, it's not just important because they serve as the digital scaffolding on which you know, society it, for good or bad is based now. It's that technical infrastructure is increasingly, and it has been for quite a while now, um, a proxy for political power. And the way that I usually describe it um, to students, and, and it seems to resonate in some way, is that arrangements of architecture are also arrangements of power. So while the internet and its original design was highly decentralized, distributed, it was subject to a lot of competition among many different companies adhering to common standards. In practice, what has evolved is that the infrastructure has developed concentrated choke points. So this is not only for societal dependencies, but also choke points for carrying out surveillance or blocking content. Um, the governments, um, including the US government, has regularly used the DNS to block access to unlawful content, such as um, sites that violate intellectual property rights, pirated movies, a site with pirated movies, or uh, you know, a luxury good knockoff sale site. Um, it's very easy to use the DNS and order the registry uh, responsible for overseeing that server uh, to redirect to a law enforcement message. China has used the DNS for censorship. Um, so while it's distributed in um, a hierarchical manner across many different institutions and systems, um, it does create that point for content control. Uh, and most recently, I just, I saw this recently that the US government uh, seized the domain names of some sites linked to Iranian government propaganda. So this is something that can be deployed in a variety of ways um, to address um, propaganda, disinformation, terrorism, intellectual property rights, or the flip side of that is to, it can be used easily to censor um, you know, media and dis dissident political um, speech. Now, uh, this turn to, I just use the domain name system as an example because it was so central in the Facebook outage, but this politicization and co-opting of infrastructure is part of a, a much broader trend of um, co-opting uh, things that you can't see, you know, the 99% of the infrastructure that's not visible to deal with some kind of a content um, issue. So all, it, it, it seems like all policymakers are talking about right now are our content, like it's going to the platform and taking down content. But you know, we all know very well um, about how the turn to infrastructure to deal with content uh, can happen easily. I mean, Amazon Web Services decision to take down the entire social me media site parlor is the perfect example of this. Or even financial intermediaries blocking uh, financial payments that happened with WikiLeaks as well, and, and it's happening today around all manner of speech. So that is, um, it's part of a broader turn to infrastructure. And of course, the centrality of the internet protocol in all this, that has been at the heart of many different battles over control of the internet, including the very recent uh, concern, uh, Michael, whether founded or not, it, you know, it's a huge concern when China and Huawei were discussing uh, possibly redesigning IP through a set of discussions it called new IP. So that's another story 
But uh, you know, the types of problems that Facebook experienced, um, th that has happened all over the internet. Um, this seems to be very inadvertent. Um, it can be intentional, uh, having false routes advertised over the, the internet or advertised from one network to others and, or leaked behind, you know, beyond the intended uh, network audience. Uh, so when you read um, about suddenly the internet routed through uh, China, <laughs> rerouted through China, or cases where Facebook, Google, and Amazon traffic have been redirected through Russia, these are examples of border gateway um, issues. So that's why I always say that border gateway protocol is actually a national security issue. And uh, Mike, I want to ask you something about this weaponization of infrastructure, uh, because it, the, the issue of like open standards versus these proprietary monocultures uh, co come into the story a little bit. Um, could you say a little bit about open standards and interoperability and what that might mean uh, from a legal perspective? Yeah, um, I think, you know, certainly I've been teaching on this topic for at least 20 years. And, and in, in the early days, it was always a very optimistic and rosy story. And I think we've learned it's a more, for the reasons you just said, it's a more nuanced story. Um, um, but, you know, think about it. If, if you had that diagram I showed you of all of those, those rules that computers need to use, imagine from an intellectual property perspective, if for instance, you had a patent on all of those rules and somebody had to pay you a license if they wanted to speak the internet language, well, you'd be very, very wealthy. Um, and in the early days of computer networking, um, we had a lot of sort of solitary systems or, or, or custom built systems. Think back to the early days of America Online. Um, and, and even on this issue of architecture and, and protocols, we had competing standards and everyone wanted, you know, the old saying is the great thing about standards is there's so many of them, ha <laughs> ha. Um, but, but at some point, the, the desire to get an agreement around these common rules in order to let systems that um, were, were programmed to speak, you have different operating systems and, and different things, we needed some layer of commonality in order to exchange data. Um, and, and eventually, uh, and one of the ways to get that agreement was an agreement that there would be no owner, there would be no control, no one would have control over the, the protocols. And so this group called the Engineer, Internet Engineering Task Force basically took it upon themselves to design these protocols as open protocols that they would all agree. And there's a whole sort of request for comment process by which they were developed. Um, but their openness is a core, uh, core attribute of why the internet became so successful. Um, and for the lawyers in the room, an example of this is um, some of the earliest information to get digitized and sold was actually legal information because lawyers wanted to search the case law and didn't want to have to do it by the books. Westlaw and Lexis built their own proprietary, essentially bulletin board systems where you would dial into their system to, to conduct legal research. Um, but once the internet became public um, <clears throat> and sort of publicly available for commercial use in the early 90s, those companies shifted all of their content onto the, net, onto the internet because of the robust uh, ability to use these open protocols like hyperlinks and other sort of things that are standardized ways to communicate. So that's the beauty, that's the optimistic story is that open standards are democratic, they're decentralized, everyone who wants to use them can use them, but they also were, were built by people building a system among trusted, a trusted network. And, and now we know that you can't trust everyone. And so as you just indicated, people can exploit these open. So the Border Gateway Patrol for, uh, Protocol, for example, uh, has been weaponized not just to route traffic through Russia, but also to deny service, to, to basically take YouTube. One way to take YouTube offline is to route a whole bunch of traffic using BGP so that it overwhelms the YouTube server in, say, Turkey, and then suddenly it becomes unavailable. So that's the good side and the bad side of open standards. But 
they are the standards that make the internet run and, and we're not likely to change them anytime soon. Um, and then let me, um, uh, uh, let me just turn to you um, and, and ask. So you've written seven books. The most recent um, was on the Financial Times best tech book of 2020, uh, The Internet in Everything, Freedom and Security in a World with No Off Switch, which is, I mean, Facebook turned itself off, but the internet, uh, there are security conferences where people say, what would it take to take the entire internet down? And it's pretty tough. Um, so you've been an open standards advocate your whole life, but you've also said we don't want a to toaster connected to a nuclear reactor, which is sort of this idea of the internet of things. The internet is becoming more than just computers. It's the baby monitors. It's uh, your automobile. All of these different devices are speaking the internet language. Um, and that's changing the game to some extent when it comes to uh, security. So what's the gist of your book and how does it tie to this uh, Facebook outage? What, can you talk a little bit about the rules and the protocols and how Facebook fits? Thank you, Michael. Uh, the gist of my latest book, uh, and I'm thrilled it just got translated in Italian. So I'm brushing up, trying to brush up on my Italian, uh, struggling to, but the gist of it, I'll say in English, is that the internet is no longer just a communication system that connects people and in information. It is a control network in which more things and people are connected and in which um, control over that underlying infrastructure is a, a proxy for political power. So this is um, certainly, we could call it the internet of things. There are many different words for this, cyber physical systems, smart systems, smart cities, it can include home appliances, uh, connected clothing or wearables. And uh, most importantly, and most relevant to the pandemic, it also includes uh, connected medical devices, uh, some which are inside the body and um, you know, insulin pumps and pacemakers, but might be connected to a wireless system. So this is not just the internet of things, it's the internet of self and that the body is now part of the digital object space. So I wrote this book because I felt there was an overemphasis on the communication uh, governance and policy issues around the internet. And I felt that the greater issue was that the internet is leaping out of screens like we are communicating through right now and moving, diffusing into the very physical world around us um, in ways that are visible and invisible. So just about everything has a physical and a cyber element. Um, and so I don't view the, the digital world and the physical world as distinct spheres anymore. It used to be that we could just turn the laptop off, turn the phone off. Very few people do, but we could choose to turn that off or shut the screen and be disconnected. And now it's very difficult to do that because um, so many systems are, are connected. So that's a very consequential issue to privacy. Um, will we ever have a, pri a private um, sphere anymore when everything is connected and we get caught up in, already in the screens of other people, but we sure are getting caught up in the um, cyber physical objects of other people too. So it moves privacy from being um, an issue through a screen where you could do notice and choice and have some, you, that already is contestable because how much choice do you have? But uh, what about, um, what about privacy in the bedroom, in the, the kitchen, in the home, in the automobile, in the workplace? Um, it really, really transforms privacy. It certainly transforms security. Um, you know, Facebook was a, really a security issue. But the, the more consequential issue is that a, an outage or even an intentional breach is no longer about losing access to be able to communicate with each other. It's about uh, potentially being, I'm going to say this in, a, in an intentionally provocative way, um, possibly being killed over the internet by losing the um, ability to have medical care or be able to drive a car. And, you know, just one more point ties directly to Facebook is that even uh, concerns around disinformation that we see so uh, starkly in Facebook, that escalates as well in the internet of things. 
because disinformation in the internet of things can be um, a life or death issue if a sensor gives a false reading um, in a medical device or an energy sensor or, or even a threat to democracy if instead of trying to influence how people vote, you just simply stop people from voting by creating um, false traffic jams um, or fake weather alarms or things that are tied into, um, you know, into what we know makes people vote or not vote. So interoperability in this environment, that's what led me to say, let's not connect the toaster to the nuclear reactor. Um, we know that um, you know, there have been many cases of uh, Russia reaching across uh, to disrupt Ukrainian energy systems. We're very, very vulnerable in this cyber physical world. Um, Bruce Schneider, who's a security expert, has described it as wildly insecure. Um, the Homeland Security Department has uh, critiqued the cyber physical security um, milieu. Um, you know, we're, we're, we have dependencies and at the same time, it's, um, it's very, very insecure. So we have these, um, these vulnerabilities, but we also have a lot of fragmentation in this space. So there, are, you could say also that we have a lot of fragmentation in the internet as a communication system, because in a way, Facebook is you know, tying it to your last point. It is a resurgence of the proprietary um, monocultures of the 1990s. Uh, there are some people watching this that probably used CompuServe or Prodigy or America Online. These were all based on uh, proprietary systems. There was a lot of fragmentation. There's a lot of fragmentation in the IoT space. What this means is that um, you, you have to raise the question, will we have um, you know, standards-based patents that limit innovation? Um, where do we want fragmentation and where don't we want fragmentation? Um, so you know, bringing that back to Facebook, Facebook, Instagram, and what's WhatsApp, the outage, part of the problem there is, and maybe I could ask you a question about antitrust actions, uh, Michael, is that it, part of the reason it was so extensive and so catastrophic is that it wasn't just um, Facebook, it was also these other systems that have been purchased by Facebook and now run over the same network, in the same networks that are run by Facebook. So I was wondering what your take is on um, you know, whether this outage will increase momentum of some of the efforts to break up the Facebook ecosystem. Yeah, it's a great question. And, and speaking of questions, I see a couple of questions posted in the Q&A and thank you for that. We're gonna turn to those very, very shortly. So please keep them coming. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it is, it is um, the fact that all three services are tied together and now tied together at a technical level um, is is evidence, right, of the the dominant position that Facebook uh, uh, possesses. And as you say, I mean, you mentioned how important Facebook is in other parts of the world, and I would just add WhatsApp. I mean, WhatsApp is the telecommunications system in large parts of the world where using traditional cell phone service or, or landlines would be prohibitively expensive, at least for cross-border communication. Um, so I've read and I don't know if it's true that one of Facebook's motivations for technically um, tying together the routing, the routing information for the WhatsApp messages and the Facebooks and the Instagram was that they understood that regulators sort of allowed them to acquire these companies, but might have second thoughts, which is exactly what's happening. And if they recommend un unbundling those deals, it will now be a lot harder to tear the tear Facebook's network apart because at the technical level, they've made that remedy much more difficult to implement. And I don't know if you have any views about whether there are good technical reasons to tie them together or whether these legal concerns may have been more the driving factor. Do you have a, do you have a view? I'm not sure about that. I mean, it, from a technical standpoint, it does make sense to uh, run them over the same networks, you know, and going back to your OSI model, you know, the difference is at the application layer and they're all running using DNS services that are uh, on connected directly to the network, um, advertised, uh, you know, the IP addresses that reach them are, are advertised via the systems that run border gateway protocol. Um, 
why it, it, in a way it wouldn't make sense to have separate private networks running each of them. Um, it would, you know, just thinking this through, if I were designing a system uh, to integrate these, I don't know what the reason would be to um, seg you know, to run different physical networks. However, the question at a logical layer is, is there a way to segment them so that um, a catastrophic outage is not that we see here is not as catastrophic. I mean, I think that is one um, engineering design question about that integration. Um, but I don't see how that ties directly to the antitrust issue and whether that would be relevant in discussions about, um, you know, disaggregating the institutions uh, for antitrust reasons. Great. And, and so I, we do want to turn to the, que the questions, but I guess let me offer you a last chance for any final takeaways and especially this, um, the point that the people who designed this network, these network protocols, were not designing it with cybersecurity in mind. And they have been, the Washington Post did a whole set of interviews with some of these engineers who are very clear that don't blame us, it wasn't the, it wasn't the task at the time. So they, they fully recognized that you wouldn't design the internet quite like they did uh, knowing what we know now. But are there any sort of final takeaways in terms of what other actors might learn from Facebook's outage that, that we should have our eyes on? I'm uh, reminded of a book that was written a long time ago called, I believe, Normal Accidents. And when you have large scale systems, problems happen. And that is that may be the reality that we'll continue to live with. I happened to be a graduate student at Cornell when in 19, the fall of 1988, when the Morris worm hit. And that's what got me interested in internet security. And since that time, you know, there has there's been problem after problem after problem, yet the internet has continued uh, to function. And I think because of that, uh, we take for granted. You know, we've we've absorbed the reality that there will be outages and there will be um, data breaches, but we can do better. We always have to do better, and we've also. Um, this is actually Michael why I wrote the Washington Post piece because this is. Here, here's how I would say it: there really is an overemphasis on the problems in the digital environment around content. So this. It, Almost all of them are about right now are about fake news, um, deep fakes, disinformation, hate speech, threats, propaganda, all kinds of really, really urgent problems. But what this um, outage in Facebook uh, reminds us of is that an equally consequential public policy issue has to be um, the digital infrastructure. And you know, it's not the cloud, it's not just the layered model, the physical and the virtual infrastructure upon which the global economy, society, and now cyber physical systems depend. So I thought that that would be a good point to make. Um, and it's not just our um, ability to, to download the kittens um, or to, to carry out even government functions or to, um, you know, to, to have uh, telemedicine, it, it actually goes far beyond that. I would say that now our food supply and our energy systems and everything about the human security and the critical systems and, uh, that help us to function on a day-to-day -day level now depend on this infrastructure. And I saw that firsthand when I went out to see a farm in Virginia that uses um, robotic milking machines to milk the cows. And the farmer was showing me the, um, you know, through the, the app on his phone, you know, an app just right next to Facebook to say, well, here's the productivity and, you know, things that are, it's a proprietary system around the cow, but it's, <laughs> but it's connected to the public internet. And so an outage in, in cyberspace is now an outage of food supply, energy, critical systems, medicine, and everything else. So I, that's that's the critical uh, takeaway to me. Yeah, and I think that, um, I agree, and I think it points up this. Uh, so so I, in the questions, um, uh, uh, Ryan, I saw that you got in first, but I wanna take, go to Anne's question first, if it's okay, because it was a point I was hoping to raise, which is, 
you know, uh, given those security risks, and one of the things about the Internet of Things in particular that's of concern is that once you put that code into a thing and then it's in a baby monitor, there's almost zero incentive to update that code if we then learn that there's a vulnerability inside that baby monitor that can allow it to be hacked. And I'm not using this as a hypothetical, it actually happened of, of uh, basically a variety of baby monitors were given some malware that then turned them into a zombie network that then attacked one of those domain name servers that Laura was talking about at the, the top of the program. But um, so then, Anne and other lawyers, you might think, well, what are the different incentives the law might give to these private actors to make sure that they're being as secure as possible? Or in, in this case, I mean, Facebook's explanation is, oops, you know, it's sort of like, oops, we tripped over, <laughs> over the, the extension cord. Um, and, and, and Anne's question is, well, maybe that was negligent. Maybe that was careless. Maybe it was careless for Facebook to be have designed its system to be so vulnerable to a simple maintenance upgrade uh, mistake. Um, and shouldn't we do the normal negligence analysis of duty, breach of the standard of care? Uh, and unfortunately, and at least with respect to outages like this, um, the economic loss doctrine in tort law says that even if there's negligence, if the only harm is economic loss, then you can't recover. But the internet of things now starts to give the internet wheels and wings and arms and other things that can physically hurt people. So the plaintiff's lawyers and the law students who might become plaintiff's lawyers should keep your eyes open because if there's a soft, if there's negligence with respect to the operation or design of software that causes physical harm, then the traditional tort remedies should become available. And I, I expect some litigation around that. In addition, the government is kind of tearing its hair apart because we rely on all of this private uh, infrastructure to do, as you're saying, critical functions, energy, secure, security, banking. And those private actors do cost benefit analysis of how secure to make their systems based on their internal cost benefit analysis without taking into account the downstream risk to other people. Um, and I think the Colonial Pipeline shutdown was sort of an example of Colonial Pipeline decided whether to pay ransom or not and whether to share, shut down. But it, it wasn't internalizing the downstream effects of all the people who got cut off from their gas. So this is another episode. My last takeaway on that one is, is that this is a, a, another takeaway on, um, on that point. And I wonder, Laura, are you comfortable responding to Ryan's question about uh, municipalities and, and privacy? Absolutely, and the two questions uh, tie together nicely, actually, because you know, with all of these vulnerabilities, the, the question is who is responsible? And you know, even though these are private networks run by industry and different kinds of actors and you know, fueled by, standards that are developed by global standard setting institutions, um, there are many different levers of influence that governments can have in these environments. One of them is just governments as enormous uh, procurement agents, you know, buying IoT systems, buying, um, you know, system, you know, social media um, security, things that layer on top of social media that can help secure it. Um, so having um, strong procurement policies is one area, um, especially in the area of IoT, there's a need for liability clarification. And that sounds like a dry area, but this is actually one of the most important, you know, heated concerns around this, because who is responsible when an outage happens in um, like the Internet of Things? Do you, is it the, the, the company that made the you know the original alarm system the one that you know put in the microchip is it um you know the a standards developer is it i mean we could decouple that on a whiteboard but there needs to be a uh, liability clarification on that there's also um enormous room for you know regulations and i'm not the kind of person that um calls for regulations lightly but in the area of the Internet of Things, because of the consumer safety issues, this is an area that absolutely needs more regulation. 
and um, municipalities are part of that. And um, you know, I think we need some government. Some uh, countries are a little bit more advanced on this, but we need a comprehensive regulations that call for things like the ability for products to be upgraded. It's not so much a matter of whether the couple with the baby monitor upgrades it. <clears throat> it is a matter of whether it even is upgradable. Right. Right. It can, does it have to be upgradable? <clears throat> and then um, I, I actually can go on about this for a long time, but I won't. But I, I just want to say one more thing, even outside of the area of direct regulation on the Internet of Things and infrastructure, there are policies that are tangentially related to this that weaken the security. And we let me say this in a provocative way. Governments have an interest in weak security. They also have an interest in strong security. And those are the values and tension where you want to have critical societal infrastructure that is secure, data that's sensitive, secure, but also uh, the ability to break into things uh, for intelligence and law enforcement reasons and um, you know, many other reasons, uh, cyber offense is part of it. So I, I, there's a need to rethink some of these um, approaches to cyber policy um, on the part of governments that in effect weaken security. So two quick examples, zero day exploit markets, you know, stockpiling of known vulnerabilities in software. Uh, Michael, you and I know back in the day that, you know, it was unheard of for someone to find a vulnerability in software and not report it to the vendor. But now what's happening is there, these um, exploits are being stockpiled for cyber offense reasons. And when you think about the consequences for human safety and national security around uh, vulnerabilities in the IoT, that's not... Um, that that will not have the salutary effects that it maybe once had, and you know many many other examples like why have um, regulations against uh, strong encryption? You could talk to any encryption designer from the 1970s um, who would say the the one thing they never imagined was that we wouldn't have strong encryption everywhere. And you know when you look at the Facebook outage um, and the you know, think about border gateway protocol and the need to have public key cryptography to provide a trust infrastructure over the things that maybe were not built with trust in mind. Um, that's a role for government too. So I could uh, go on about other things, but those are a few examples. Great. Um, and it looks to me like we've answered the questions there. Uh, Ryan, I guess slightly off topic, but the other role for municipalities, this is more a frustration in cyber policy that I have is that when municipalities think that internet access ought to be like a utility and actually want to provide it as a utility through so-called municipal Wi-Fi programs, there have been, I won't attribute the reasons, but there have been states that have overridden the ability of cities to set up their own public Wi-Fi networks in order to give everyone access. And sadly, a lot of a lot of learning was lost during this pandemic because we didn't have more uh, robust municipal Wi-Fi. But to your question about the role of cities, if they want to set up, set themselves up as network providers, <laughs> they better do it with security and privacy in mind for all the reasons we've discussed. Um, so I think we've hit time exactly an hour. Um, and uh, I've learned a lot from Professor Denardis, and I hope uh, those in the audience have enjoyed it as well. Uh, we will try to stay abreast of the breaking news and the next time there is a, a breaking internet or, or intellectual property piece of news, we're likely to be back here again. Uh, but until then, I would just like to thank everyone for your time and attention and Laura, any parting, uh, parting words? Just thank you for organizing this uh, on the fly and so quickly. And uh, it's great to see a lot of familiar names um, and uh, enjoyed the chat, appreciate the chat and the questions and uh, everyone stay safe. Yeah, bye all.